Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Michael Miller of Tactile Knife Company. Since the last time Michael was on the show, we've seen Tactile Knife Company enjoy the release of some impressive collaboration knives with two highly esteemed makers. And now they have an exciting new collaboration uh, that looks to define the state of the art of folding knives and fully show off the machining prowess of the proud Texas company. We'll catch up with Michael and find out more about this uh, extremely desirable knife and others. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And if you'd like to, head on over to Patreon to help support the show. Quickest way to do that is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Michael, good to see you, sir. Welcome good back to, to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. So we were talking right before we started rolling here uh, that I did not have a chance to go to Blade Show Texas this year, uh, but I was really kind of thinking I would uh, at least this time last year, um, but I sadly had to miss it. How did it go for you? You guys are, uh, as I mentioned, a proud Texas company. I'm, I'm sure you had quite a presence there. Yeah, Blade Show Texas is right in our backyard, uh, so we always enjoy being able to sleep in our own beds and go to a show every day uh, and get to see the fans. Uh, the The booth was crazy slammed for the for the majority of the day, both times. Uh, so, like, man, until like two o'clock, we didn't have a chance to even eat lunch. It was kind of shoulder to shoulder, people looking at our new knives, looking at the Archer, looking at a new prototype that we'll talk about later. And looking at just our our classic offerings, both from Tactile Turn and Tactile Knife Company. Yeah, that's uh, at your uh, area at Blade Show in Atlanta. Your booth it's more like an area because it's long and you have a lot of stuff on display. It is always uh, perking with uh, with activity, bubbling with activity because. Um, well, uh, for those who maybe haven't heard the the other times you've been on the show or aren't maybe as familiar uh, with. Uh, tactile knife company it, it it spawned out of tactile turn uh, a really highly esteemed pen company uh at, down there in, in texas and um you know known for your machining and your milling and uh and here comes this and so that <laughs> you're i'm sorry I, this is the long way around to say your your atlanta setup was so big you had so many knives but also pens and you also had your kitchen knives and everything um Anyway, what, what's it been like defining the brand? You're a new brand, a relatively new company, but man, I mean, you, you, you came out so hard. So like, as you mentioned, we started off as a pen company. So we have that prowess and that we have that kind of knowledge under our belt. Uh, so we didn't come into this situation blind. Uh, coming in as a knife company, man, like it took a long time for us to get our, our feet underneath us uh, to figure out grinding blades, figuring out making a folder. Cause like we didn't start off making fixed blades. We started off with a, with a flipper, uh, liner lock flipper, none, none the least. And it really made us be able to challenge ourselves and push ourselves to the limit, push our machines and our capability of production to the limit as well. Uh, and push our team to a limit of solving problems uh, because we faced many along the way. Uh, the development of our slip joint later, the ve development of the, the Maverick, which is our, our crossbar lock system, as well as the development of the new Archer uh, has been a challenge every single time. And we've had a great team behind us being able to step up to the plate and uh, face whatever comes our way. Uh, how much do you think um, it helps a knife company such as or your knife company? Uh, being in pens beforehand, um, those kind of adjacent uh, people who buy tactile turn pens are pen nerds. Let's face it, mm -hmm. and uh, and the the crossover is heavy between pens, watches, knives, lights, that kind of thing. Um, do you think that that sort of EDC uh, um, environment has sort of cross cross pollinated uh, different brands? For sure, it's cross-pollinated. So, like, we, we definitely have drawn over some customers from Tactile Turn, uh, but you do have a kind of a sticker shock because 
uh, it's hard for to make a USA made product uh, and have it be affordable. Thankfully, uh, with the scale of our pin company, we, we are able to continue to have a hundred dollar offering. Uh, even now we have an aluminum offering that's at 80 bucks. And it's a little bit more challenging to convince somebody to spend $80 on a pin to now spend $300 on a pocket knife. Uh, we have quite a few things that are our goals to lower those prices, but man, the operating costs, the both in the, the machines, the keeping this building and the lights going, as well as keeping the employees and all the, all the labor involved, all those expenses add up. Uh, and it's, it's been, it's been a, uh, interesting thing trying to keep the knife company growing trying to make it where it's uh, self-sustaining and trying to chip away at, at goals that we have uh, definitely it helps being in the EDC uh, community and I, not just having a knife company not just having a pin company but having both they feed off of each other and one thing we'll talk about I'm sure in a second is we've even ventured into the into the flashlight world uh, so we have a 14500 flashlight collaboration with Charles Wiggins, who's really well renowned in the custom flashlight community. Uh, and those are actually releasing here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so oh. we, we plan to extend that extend that relationship even further with the, the carry community, it's not just focused on pins and not just solely focused on knives. I love that. Uh, and that looks like a beautiful light. It looks It reminds me of something I once saw Jim Skelton uh, show off, but you know, I, I'm not much of a light guy, but I, I think I could be convinced, you know, uh, by something cool. Um, the, this is a good time to get into the fact that you make everything. Is that right? How important is it that everything is USA made, but also Texas made? Not only that, like it's our goal and it's our, it's our mission to make everything in house that we can. Uh, the, the beauty of that is that you control the process. If you control the processes, A, you don't have to worry about the timeline of other companies, so you're not having to ship parts out and then wait for those parts to come back or wait for people to make parts that you're needing to be able to build your product. It's all on your shoulders. The issue with that is that it creates an Atlas situation where the world's on your shoulders and you have to do every single thing. Uh, and we continue to achieve that goal by adding more machines, adding more personnel, and adding more skill sets uh, so that we can refine and hone that process. That's uh, I, I would say that tactile uh, knife company is a really good example. There's the ongoing conversation on this show for years at this point about uh, more getting more manufacturing of uh, great knives in the United States and then making them affordable. Now affordable of, of course is a relative term, um, but uh, when you consider how everything, like you said, is made in house, made by skilled uh, machinists on amazing machines with incredible uh, materials. And you're probably also already a knife person. Um, it's not. It's not uh, uh, outside the the realm of possibility because you're doing it. There, there are maybe a handful of other companies who are, but you're you're competing with, uh, you know, the the Chinese companies that are making these spectacular knives, and you're winning at that game and bringing it in like at the same price or under. 100%. It's our goal to compete on a global level. Uh, and we continue to strive to do that. Uh, we also at the same time want to make the best offering that we can. So it's kind of a, a weird balance. We're going for that upper echelon. And we're also going for something that's more budget friendly, uh, trying to thread that needle and have a diverse product line that are good quality products on all tiers uh, is definitely something that we struggle with. That's why we've we've uh, reached out to designers. That's why we also have the um, some knives that we don't produce on the production level just because we can't. Uh, so we have some knives that we try and make a couple hundred a month. We have some knives that we're only able to make 60 to 80. Uh, and with those come a higher price tag. With those definitely change things. So yes, we, we do try and compete at a global level, but we also try and compete at our own level uh, and kind of forge our own path. Uh, up front, I talked about how exciting the collaborations are that you've done, and I want to talk about those. But uh, I'm going to use the Rockwall, your very first knife. It was kind of a proof of concept, but also a very finished, like absolute 
a winner of a knife, like an amazing knife that ha that lives a uh, you know an ongoing life in various iterations. Uh, this is an in-house design, and I know you have a really exciting in-house design to show us in, in a little while. Uh, so. Um, though I'm very excited about your collaborations, it's also really important and exciting to me to know uh, that you have the in-house talent to make outstanding uh, knives and design beautiful looking knives as well. Yeah, uh, our engineer, a couple offices down, uh, Matt Palmore, he's he's really the backbone of our, uh, of our design. Uh, we work together uh, and we work together as a team, uh, both from our owner Will's perspective and uh, the people that are passionate about knives, like, for example, Tim uh, Halbert, who runs our EDM equipment. He's a custom knife maker uh, from from his before he started working for uh, with us. And he hopes to continue to be a custom knife maker. He even has his own private designs that we're going to be releasing here here shortly. Uh, so like as a community and as a group, we're passionate about this community. We're passionate about our products and we're passionate about refining, refining those both in-house and also uh, with our collaborative efforts. Yeah, I mean, that that passion is obvious. It it really shows through. And people, I, I mean, in my this is uh, in my experience, people really want to support companies like that, where you can tell that they just ah, they love it. Uh, I have, believe it or not, spoken to very um, famous knife makers who are, are very popular uh, heads of uh, very popular companies who don't even care about knives, just having that a talent for it and admitted it outright. And I was like, hmm. Yeah, you're saying the quiet part out loud, it and uh, but people love those designs. So, uh, but I think that when there's a real passion, people want to be a part of it. You know, there's mm -hmm. a pride of ownership, and they and they grow to like the people behind it. They, they go to Blade Show a few times, they meet you, they meet Will, and all the other awesome people you have working there, and they want to they want to help support that. Um, I, I want to talk about your your latest collaboration because I I fell in love with it uh, uh, when I knew we were going to be talking. Uh, I went back on the website, hadn't been there in a little while, and checked in. And man, this archer, TJ Schwartz, wow. So real quick, a uh, little bit of backstory. So TJ Schwartz uh, is a is a prolific designer. Uh, he's designed for companies like CRKT, uh, for Koenig, and for Millet, uh, as well as even Mastrop. Uh, he's really has an eye and a and a for designing. Uh, he came from a goal of trying to design for the automotive industry. So you see a lot of those sleek, really aggressive uh, kind of sports car lines in some of his work. And I think that that's, that transfers over. So this is the, the Archer. Uh, and it is a frame lock flipper uh, utilizing as much milling and as much handwork as we can, as we can offer uh, for still trying to say a production company. Uh, so this is as refined as we can get with the processes and the equipment that we have. There's a massive amount of milling, both hard milling for the blade, uh, as well as for all the titanium components, um, 3D milled pocket clip and really refined to the highest level we can. I kind of call it like the Cadillac of our offering. It's, we have our standard GMC, uh, but for with the with the Maverick, with the Rockwall, and with everything else that we do, but whenever you want to dial things up to ten, dial them up to eleven. That's where the Archer comes into play. Um, Magna cut blade steel, skiff multi row bearings. Uh, kind of one of the we went as far out as we could, uh, <laughs> as far out of our way as we could to make this the best offering we could. Yeah, I was I was uh, as I was pouring over the specs. Uh, first of all, I noticed that you call it a hyper knife, which I think is just cool. It's like a hyper car, you know, yeah. uh, it's just like outrageously engineered knife. And um, I, I noticed that, it, well, it's called the Archer. It has this beautiful, like, um, it looks like the, the, uh, the flights on a, on a, on a, uh, on an arrow. What do you call those things? Flight the feathers on an arrow. Or, yeah. Feather. Yeah. 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 It's just beautiful texture. If actually, if you could hold it up and, and let us uh, see that, I'm not sure how close yeah uh, we can get it we're gonna see if we can get get this showing up showing up but you can see tactile turn was always known for its texture we've definitely brought that over with tactile knife company and this mm. has a massive amount of texturing on it uh it's looks really beautiful whenever whenever we add the finishing work to it uh we do offer a smooth model and 
here's a kind of funny fact. Uh, to make a smooth knife that is contoured, 3D contoured and machined, you over double your production time to create the handles. Uh, just because you have to add so many micro passes to remove every single line, every single layer to be able to make it where it has a glossy smooth finish to it. Uh, so we actually don't make that many smooth archers. If you happen to be able to have a chance to own one, uh, consider yourself lucky. Um, and we even also, like we've talked about it, this is the, the hyper knife. We, we pull out bells and whistles and also add inlays. Uh, this is actually copper uh, that's slowly God. heated to a point where it turns red. Uh, and it's really kind of a, we add all the finishing touches that we can to make these, these archers as good as we possibly can. So it's uh, already a prestige knife, but you're 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 doing little little flourishes. I mean that copper, that heat treated copper, is spectacular. Uh, I, I happen to find that. Um, uh, let's see, Jim called it quill texturing. Mm -hmm. uh, I find that also incredibly uh, well. It was very nice to look at, and I I have a feeling it's going to feel great in hand, and yeah. you know just have uh, great texturing. Uh, can you hold it up again uh, with the blade out? Sure. Just, I want to inspect it again man yeah he he you know you can see his design sense in this especially in the handle to me um i, yeah. I love his overland model i love his perpetua you, you mentioned he met, he designed for uh, mass drop um i i love his designs and look at that uh, that curve in the handle puts the presents the blade at a very useful it makes angle. it very natural yeah Wow. So uh, I noticed that the lock bar insert mm -hmm. is also magna cut. Uh, we are actually transitioning that to AEBL. Uh, we we did do magna cut. Uh, we were just having a couple couple minor issues um, with production that created more scrap. Uh, the units that are out there with magna cut, we don't have, we have differential heat treating, so there's a difference in the heat treat for the lock bar insert than the blade. So you're never going to have an issue with that. Uh, but AEBL being a tool steel has a little bit more uh, flexibility as far as not scrapping as many parts. Uh, oh. It's just as good, and we're not gonna we're not gonna be seeing any issues with that. Right, right. Uh, we want Magna Cut on our blades. We don't really care if it's on our lock bar inserts, but it sounds cool. Basically, yeah. I mean, to me, I I read that and I I, I like it made me smile. I'm like, it's all part of the hyper knife thing, the skiff bearings, the 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 you know you can't get more machined without looking you know it can't get more machined you put so much uh, detail on it and then you have all these super premium parts was the point of that is this all you know is this a, a flex knife so to speak is this uh, kind of updating people um in terms of like what you've learned over the past couple of years now check out what we can do for sure, yeah. You, if you look at YouTube, you can find kind of some shop tours of our of our facility, and we're sitting on like four million dollars worth of equipment. Uh, a lot of it's turning capabilities, a lot of it's EDMs, a lot of it's in the mills. Uh, but we we have at our fingertips the ability to make pretty much anything, um, and we really wanted to utilize that. So like each blade sees the EDM two to three times. Uh, it's it's going to be three times here in about a month. Uh, and then each handle has multiple milling operations, uh, as well as the clips. And then all of the turning, we went as as uh, in depth as we could. Uh, internal lockings for the for the pivot, and really dial things up as much as we could. Uh, also, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, but the hard milling that we're doing on the blade, uh, every eight blades that we mill, we have to change end mills. Uh, so the end mills are what are actually removing the material and they dole every single eight blades. So we've got a rotating cycle of drill bits to be able to of, of uh, milling uh, end mills to be able to get a very clean, precise result out of our out of our in hard milling for this feathering. Because like we've talked about texture, there's even even texturing in this recess area that you're not going to really be able to pick up on the camera. Uh, but really, we utilize as much as we can, um, even hand finishing as well. I, I want to ask you, since, I mean, there's no better person, uh, no better company uh, in general to ask these questions to um, about some of these terms of art, uh, first of all. But but before I ask you those, uh, I want to just back up a little bit and say it was very counterintuitive to me to hear that contouring a handle 
is way more work uh, than uh, putting all the the detail, all the mill detail. Because I always assumed uh, that that it would be roughed out and then like sort of just sanded or something smooth in a way that in my mind was easy to do uh, as if titanium were butter and you can just sort of form it. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're saying it just goes over a million or like many, 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 many times until, uh, until everything's chipped away. That's not that contoured handle. You still have to run it over some scotch bright just to get the last little remnants of machining lines. Uh, but man, there's, Every single line is a pass, and to be able to get rid of that line, you have to add 10 passes to be able to accomplish that. Not only that, you're having to do it with an end mill that is not for removing material fast, but for removing material cleanly, uh, which again, slows it down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just definitely adds to the amount of, of passes, which adds the amount of machine time, which makes it difficult more difficult to, to make. So like if you see smooth, like consider that collector's grade uh, or consider that just as refined as we can get. Uh, you mentioned hard, hard milling. What, mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? Okay. So uh, sharpening titanium, sharpening aluminum, uh, it, it'd be really easy to remove that material, but it's not very strong. Uh, whenever, whenever you're milling, it's the exact same thing. Uh, the harder the material gets, uh, the harder it is to mill. Uh, so hard milling is referring to milling a blade that's already hardened. Uh, so you can do quite a bit of milling in the soft state, but if you really want those crisp lines, if you really want the cons uh, the consistency of uh, evenly milled uh, as far as like, uh, because these have to get surface ground. If you if you machine pre-heat treat, then whenever it comes back from heat treat, you have to surface grind it. If you want everything to be centered, uh, you really can only have one option and that's to mill after it comes back from heat treat in the hardened state. Uh, that makes it very difficult, adds, again, time, adds expenses of the drill bits uh, or the end mills, uh, as well as um, just operators and even scrap rate, because we have a higher scrap rate because we're dealing with removing material from the hardened state of the knife. Wow, yeah, yeah. And uh, so more time, uh, more effort, but you also have to go, you know, slow i would imagine just to maintain heat treat right you don't want fast mm -hmm. whirring machines all over that blade well in the area that it is you wouldn't have that issue we don't have that issue as far as like the heat but if the heat treat is affected in this area it's not going to be as important as for the edge or for the blade in the in the cutting area um but we do keep a very very close eye on even outside processes like coatings making sure that we don't mess with the heat treat after it's heat treated. Uh, EDM, uh, I have a vague idea what that is. What is that? Uh, so it's a, it's a wire process. Uh, so imagine Rapunzel and all her hair. Uh, it uses a brass wire uh, that is cutting away a stack of material. Uh, so a typical like laser has one flat sheet of material that goes buzz, 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 and is done. Water jet is very similar, um, except for it erodes it with sand that is mixed with the water. Uh, a wire EDM actually creates an arc on this brass wire. Uh, the good thing about that is it's a very, it's the most precise way of cutting um, over those three options. Uh, laser is number two, ED, uh, water jet is number three, but EDM really has that crown because it's a very slow process that makes sure uh, you're removing very, a couple thousandths of an inch that is very precise and very refined versus going fast and going crude. Uh, this is like, this is the go low and slow uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, one benefit about EDM though, uh, is that you're able to stack things. So instead of cutting one layer of material, you're cutting six or you're cutting wow. eight sometimes. So every single time a part comes off, you have eight parts that come off. Uh, versus a, a laser is very fast, but only one at a time. Uh, it is still substantially slower than lasers, substantially slower than water jet, but it is a very, very precise. Uh, therefore, it's, that's why we rely on it for the archer. It's slower, uh, but mm -hmm. but do you save time on the tail end in terms of cleaning up? You're saying uh, if the other methods are more crude and you have to do more cleanup. Uh, Typically, whenever you're talking about water jet, you're going to have either 
belt finish afterwards, or you're going to have a mill finish. So you're going to chuck it into your mill and then you're going to remove the outside perimeter with the mill. Uh, the benefit of the EDM is that it is a much more refined process and leaves us much better finish. Uh, so you, yes, you do save some time with that. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's still more of a time sink uh, to run things off of an EDM. Uh, and to get a more refined uh, finish, you also have to add more passes. So we, we run it fast where we can. We run it very slow where we can't. So in the time you personally have been um, involved in the world of building things with these kind of machines, lathes and uh, CNCs and EDMs, how, how much have you seen uh, in your time this manufacturing process evolve or change? Uh, so we had actually had an EDM whenever we first started, whenever I first started tactile in 2020. Uh, it's what cuts the internal springs for our side clicks. I don't really cut this one right here, uh, but there's a, a spring here that allows you to reset the mm -hmm. click. Uh, and we, we bought one of those so that we could get it in-house. But as soon as we started a knife company, we utilized it for cutting the handles, cutting the blades for the rock wall. Um, and so we've always had that under our belt. We've always had good mills under our belt, uh, but we've really refined things in the areas of surface grinding, of uh, bevel grinding, and um, of even the mill department. Uh, we've transitioned from running slower machines to running robo drills, uh, which are kind of like the, the top Cadillac standard. They're what Apple uses very fast, very fast tool changes, very fast rapids. Uh, for those that know milling terms, and it's able to really do our processes to the to the most precise, but also fast uh, in terms of speed. You know, all the, all this, um, you know, talking about producing everything in house. I mean, even making screws and that kind of thing. Uh, it 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 underlines uh, to me the importance of self reliance and how, in your case, as a company, I mean, as long as you can get materials. Um, you know, and people show up to work, you can be making knives. Um, whereas, um, I don't know, most other ways of operating in the, in the modern uh, market is way more risky in terms of oh, mm -hmm. are, are my materials going to come from, or is my process overseas going to sync with my uh, domestic schedule or whatever it is. And, and, uh, as, <laughs> as the world becomes a less stable place and we've seen that fluctuate before, but still as the world, uh, you know, uh, it's nice to know that you have control, I would imagine. For sure. Yeah. We, our self-reliance means also that the buck stops with us. So if we mess something up, it's our fault. Uh, we can't blame somebody else for some of our mistakes. Uh, because again, we're not we're not ordering any of our of our knives. Uh, these are all done here. Uh, our heat treat is done locally, and we work very closely with them. Uh, the only thing that you see on our knives that we're not making ourselves are like washers, stop pins, and bearings. Uh, other than that, everything's done by us. Our pins, our springs are made two miles down the road, and we work very closely with them as well. Uh, we try and bring every single process that we can for both companies uh, in-house as much as we can. I love that. I love that model. And it, it, like I said before, it just it should be an inspiration to others. Let's talk about this new knife that I didn't even know uh, existed, but you showed right before we started rolling. It's very uh, nice looking. So I, I don't know if this is going to be the grand reveal, but this is definitely the first first point time that it's really seen much of the light of day. Uh, so this is the Chupacabra. Uh, it's an in-house design utilizing uh, the Snex Super Lock. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar with that locking system, it is a kind of a hook system that pushes in here. You have a stop pin that creates a triangle on the upper side of your knife uh, versus a, like a bar lock. So there's there's nothing in the in here as far as locking system for getting in the way of the blade's actuation. Uh, I personally use my thumb, and we we made sure to give you clearance where the blade can drop on your finger before you close. Uh, but if you want to use your index finger, many people here at the shop do. Uh, you can have a away from the blade operating system. Uh, where you're not ever ever risking cutting your finger. Oh, that Snex uh, lock. What is it called? The Super Lock. Mm -hmm. uh, that's featured uh, uh, by uh, you know on the 
the Civivi Vision FG, and I think we did a version of that. And uh, that's exciting um, to me to see uh, um, new locking systems get licensed out and proliferate uh, like uh, the, the we've seen the shark lock. We've seen the new versions of the axis lock uh, and 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 others i think that's great i love that i mean it's cool when a company re retains their their patent rights for it for a while but it's also great to see other people um take it and run with it because i mean uh, i watched snacks uh, like i'm sure many of us did on instagram sort of develop that lock and so now to yeah. see it out uh in a place where we can grab it is great I do believe this is the first United States interpretation of this of this mechanism. Uh, so we're really, really happy to do that. Uh, one of the other beauties is that this was uh, open source. Uh, so he didn't patent it and he didn't make it where um, you had to jump through hoops to be able to use it. We've actually refined it because like, I'm sure that people that have, have messed with the, the Wii version that you referenced earlier, uh, you can bring this lock out of out of the system uh, versus this has a has has a track system so you can't dislodge this um, and it took us a while to we've been working on this since shoot October or something like that and really have taken taken our time on refining this we're like a 20 something reiteration reiterations of this lock of making it where we don't have stick making it where we don't have lock uh, rock making it where we don't have lock fail uh, and it's it's been enjoyable to bring this to market, and I think this is a great package. And also, um, we've done this in the most budget friendly way as possible. This should be coming in a little bit more than a bear, and a decent amount under a rock wall. Oh, uh, so this sweet. is going to be the the cheapest the cheapest pocket clip knife that we offer, including a very deep pocket clip uh, that I think a lot of people are going to really enjoy. Oh my gosh, man. Uh, to be able to get that and have it uh, made in the States um, and also have that lock. And then, and then let's talk about the design. I mentioned earlier uh, how the rock wall was an in-house design and then you had a bunch of collaborations. I know the bear also was. Um, and now this, it, it, I love seeing that, uh, that the design shops are, are, are there in-house as well. And so yeah, that. This is the rock wall if you're familiar with size comparison. Uh, and then this is a Maverick. So we are smaller than a Maverick, but larger than a rock wall. Uh, and as far as the thickness, we are sitting uh, a little bit thicker than a, than a Maverick. But yes, like you mentioned, this is an in-house design. Um, Matt's uh, had to design how the locking mechanism was going to work. A lot of things were uh, kind of... Um, based off of that because once you have like a locking mechanism uh for example the the an ax uh crossbar lock system you have to allow for that much space so the the locking mechanism here not only is this triangle in this corner for the lock but it has this massive bar that comes back through here that uh has a coil spring inside of it to be able to give it that that pushing forward mechanism to be able to uh push the lock in there to keep it secure uh, so it's been really a pleasure to be able to to make this knife, be involved in the design team that uh, that kind of helped refine a few aspects of this, uh, and really really honored that uh, our team was able to come up with this in house. So uh, you're making this uh, an affordable, you know, more affordably uh, aimed knife. What uh, materials are you looking at in, in terms of blade steel and handle materials? Uh, Magna Cut, as always, uh, 6364 HRC, and then we're rocking aluminum handles on this model. Uh, we, uh, depending on demand, we may uh, try and uh, stretch things to all the way up to titanium, but we definitely are going to offer G10s and some micartas as well. Uh, another really good thing about this is that uh, I had a knife that I wanted to change handles on one of these uh, earlier today, and I was able to do it within like three minutes as my first time taking apart and putting back together one of these, uh, one of these um, chupacabras. So this should be very easy to uh, modify if it's something you're wanting to do. Um, we do want to also encourage like aftermarket scales like we did with the, with the Maverick and work with some people and let them be able to produce scales if they want. Uh, you will also see some offerings from us as, as well. If you want to stay direct. Is this one of, is this the first knife you've made with aluminum handles? Uh, 
It is the first knife we've made with aluminum handles. Uh, we've been, uh, Tactile Turn was known for making aluminum pins uh, since like its its foundation. And we've taken a long break from doing that for Tactile Turn as well. Uh, last year we worked with aluminum on a, of some projects and we're like, hey, we need to find a way to incorporate this with, for the knife company as well. Uh, so this is the first first step in that direction. I'm, I am a huge sucker for aluminum. I love aluminum handle blades. Uh, yeah, I just do. And and I love how they wear in. I love how they feel in hand. Um, and uh, yeah, well, that's cool. I'm excited about that because um, it's nice to have a metal knife uh, that's not steel. And uh, sometimes titanium isn't uh, isn't what you want. And anyway, I love it. I'm excited to see that. Uh, so Chupacabra, how did you decide on the name? And uh, we were talking a little bit about that before. I'm a kind of a uh, a, a nerd for cryptids and chupacabra that got my ears perked. So tactile's design language in house is typically very much minimalistic, classic, simple, stylish. Um, and the chupacabra kind of goes outside of that. Uh, so that's one of being from Texas, being from North Texas. Uh, there's always the rumor about the goat sucker, uh, which is the Spanish translation for chupacabra. Uh, typically, you're either talking about like a, a catless, uh, hairless cat or a hairless raccoon or a weird looking dog. Uh, but this is supposed to be lore for a demon kind of goat killing animal. Uh, so this being a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more edgy, a little bit more out there. Uh, I think that the, the name suits it well. Yeah, I do too. And very mysterious, you know, they, uh, animals show up without any blood in them, but they have two puncture holes. I, I like the idea of, um, well, you know, naming, naming a knife after something that's mythical like this or, or legendary like this, but it's also kind of in keeping with the fact that you've named a, a number of a couple of knives after counties um yeah. well the the bear and the rock wall and and really kind of uh, embracing your texas heritage I, I think that's cool have you ever seen anything that approximates a chupacabra while out and about in north texas uh not me personally i've seen plenty of bobcats but plenty of coyotes and everything else uh but uh not, nothing personally uh, i will also mention that the archer is a county as well uh, it's out in about an hour and a half away from my house, Archer County. Um, and yeah, so we, we've stuck with the county names. This is the first step outside of that. Uh, and it still keeps with some North Texas folklore or Texas folklore. Uh, I love the sheep's foot blade because um, you get all of the use of that point uh, yeah. down low. You get a lot. You got a, a nice belly there, though and um but still a point i like a knife i like to know that in a pinch you could use it as a thrusting instrument or yeah. a, you know puncturing instrument and uh so um I, I really like the blade is that a a flat grind i'm i'm assuming so everything we have right now is flat ground uh with with our beveling machine uh and it's probably going to stay that way for the next couple of years um so yes everything from the rock wall to the chupacabra is a flat ground blade so to, to hollow grind a blade uh, with a mill, it, do you have this? Do you run into the same thing as contouring a titanium handle? Is it that same concept, or you're just going pass after pass, except in inverse? So for that, um, we're really gonna have to have to stretch things a little bit. One second. So like, say this is a blade. Uh, our machine has a donut, and our donut's able to remove material it can't really get to the point where it's a it's able to hollow grind unless it tilts all the way like this and then that would be able to scoop uh if there are machines that do that uh the people that are utilizing that like um chris reeves and other companies are transforming uh, more like a surface grinder into a beveling machine uh, the beveling machines that are are made for beveling uh, typically aren't that aren't that great at hollow grinding. It is one of their goals to be better, and we are keeping an eye on that. Uh, and whenever it is able to get to a standard that we can uh, offer in house, and if we have the ability to, uh, that is a capability that we've we've definitely um, tried to pursue and will continue to pursue. Yeah, I kind of had a just an inkling. I don't know where I heard it, but that it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, unless you're standing there with a with a a blade against a wheel or against a grinder, you know, doing it yourself. Yeah. Uh, um, 
So that's that's kind of interesting. But uh, I do know from the rock wall, which is my only uh, tactile knife, that uh, man, uh, that's a that, this is a flat ground knife, and this comes to such a wickedly sharp, thin behind the edge edge. Uh, this is a great slicer, and also a great. Uh, it has a great point. I love this knife. We try and keep a, a ten thousand edge uh, from the from the bevel grinder, and then once it goes through tumbling, that gets a little bit smaller, to, closer to about seven uh, before we start sharpening. And we try and again add as much of a height as we can. So, like for example, the the archer's uh, height is uh, for the bevel is on the higher side, uh, and it makes us be able to have a good, very thin behind the edge. Uh, that keeps everything slicey uh, because if it's not a good slicer, if it's not a good tool, we don't really want to be making it. Yeah. I think uh, people are, people tend to cut with their knives and I don't mean to be facetious, but uh, like, you know, there, there was a long period of time where everyone wanted to know that they could uh, hammer their folder into a tree and climb up on it or whatever uh, they needed to pry open with their knife. But uh, you know, really that isn't, much needed for most of us what they what people want is a refined um cutting instrument that also looks and feels good and that's another thing about uh tactile it's right in your name they feel good in hand and i would imagine uh the archer is uh is no slouch in those terms with that um with that quill texture how about the chupacabra uh you're 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 gonna you're starting with the aluminum are you milling into that as well so with the aluminum, we have flat scales uh, and we really with this are keeping just as minimalist and as basic as possible. Uh, we, we will be making options in the future that probably have the tech texturing. At the moment, this is again, we're trying to go for as affordable and as, okay. as entry level as we can. Uh, so with aluminum, the way we're doing this, it is uh, easy for us to make flat uh, and therefore are able to offer it at the price tag we are. Got you, got you. Right, of course. The more time it spends on the machine, the more money it's going to cost. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, awesome. I can't wait for this. I'm really looking forward to the Chupacabra. Something else. Uh, what about this light? Awesome. So, um, for I've been in the kind of high end custom flashlight community for for a long time since like 2014. Uh, I remember seeing Hanko Machine Works 2015. I owned Hanko's, owned Oklahoma's, uh, for those that know, like some of the top end custom night, uh, flashlight makers. Uh, and I was had the privilege to meet Charles Wiggins in 2017. And Charles Wiggins in the flashlight world is a kind of mastermind for drivers, which is the electronic boards that are used for these flashlights. He designs his own, he makes things that innovate and change the game. Uh, and this is a 14500, which is Kind of like a AAA battery, a uh, AA battery, uh, but more like for high output. Uh, so as far as like your diameter that you're thinking, imagine a AA battery uh, with a little bit of a diameter added for the for just the casing. Uh, and then he was able to design a driver that was able to shave off nearly half an inch uh, from the overall length. So most things that are in this 14500 category have about this much height to them. Uh, so being shorter, this is able to be much more pocketable. Uh, again, you talked about our texturing. We have our tactile texturing both on the front and on the back. We have smooth in this kind of hourglass uh, middle section, and we're able to offer three modes that are non-programmable, uh, but are really great uh, from a five lumen I believe all the way to a 500 and something lumen. Wow. Uh, we're getting great uh, output out of the battery as far as how long it's lasting. And this is really just our our first, first step into uh, the flashlight industry uh, and definitely an amazing first step in my opinion. I've worked with other flashlight companies in the past uh, and this is this is really great for for how specialized this is. Um, so wait, is this available now or is this something still in the works? Uh, we'll be having uh, the first release of these available through Tactile Turn uh, this month. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I have to ask you some questions because like I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a uh, much of a flashlight guy, but I can appreciate, like I love pens and I love watches. I can appreciate the artistry and why someone would be uh, drawn to them. And actually, uh, 
for someone who carries it, you know, an Olight, I see that. And that's something for me personally, I would buy. And then that would be the only flashlight I would never ever need unless I get hooked because you, you got me hooked on it. But uh, so I want to, I want to find out you're talking about a driver and how the driver that you're using by Charles Wiggins is innovative and changes the game. I, it, that means not explain that to me. Please. Okay. So again, the, the circuit boards, uh, circuit board this utilized here to be able to ho- host the emitter, which is what, what's creating the lumen uh, typically is able having to be in a pill, which is very thick and very large. So the pill is basically like a container for the driver, for the emitter. And it takes over a large section of, of the flashlight uh, because we are able to, to minimize that, we were able to make this piece, which is the front head of the flashlight, about a half an inch smaller. And because of that, reduce the overall length of, of the flashlight. Uh, it's really, really, um, it's the only reason why we're able to do this in-house as far as the production of this. Uh, and we're not making the boards ourselves, but we are assembling and doing all, all of the uh, thermal um, applications to be able to make it where this is able to conduct the electricity. Uh, we're putting the boards in ourselves. We're getting raw board sheets and pulling them out with the emitters that are already on there, uh, applying those and then assembling these these units, adding the, the clicker to the back, which it is a manual clicker. If you can hear this on the yeah. microphone. Uh, and we, again, we have three modes, so you can do one click and then you can do half clicks to go th- pulse through the modes, or you can do full clicks uh, to be able to pulse through them. I mean, what, what kind of learning curve? I mean, it's like, uh, okay, now we figured out knives. Now let's work on flashlights. Like what kind of uh, uh, ramp up process in R&D did it take to start on this? The R&D for this, um, thankfully, because we worked with Charles, um, he streamlined a lot of that. So all of the like computer side of it is not something we have to do. Uh, the the incorporation of how to assemble and how to uh, do the, that process was a learning curve. And Kevin, who's in charge of our lathe department, uh, he's the individual that worked hand in hand with Charles, as well as Travis, who runs our uh, runs a lot of our lathes on the floor. Uh, those three individuals are really the core cornerstones of building this flashlight. Uh, we bought a, a new machine a year and a half ago uh, with the goal and with the with the drive to be able to to make a project like this, and we were really really glad that we were able to make this happen. So so this uh, let me let me so it sounds like you got to work with a hero uh, in Charles Wiggins. That's pretty cool, you know, a, a flashlight hero of yours. Uh, was this your initiative? Let's make a light, guys. It was my introduction. Uh, so like. Kevin wasn't I wasn't aware of Charles Wiggins, uh, but it was really Will's drive. Will's the owner. Uh, he's been wanting to make a flashlight for years, and since before I started working here, uh, so 2019, 2018 probably. And it was it just makes sense because you do so many turn things to offer a flashlight as well. Because you offer something in the everyday carry side of things, offering a flashlight fits in hand in hand. Uh, so like I have multiples of Charles custom flashlights. So this is wow. just different drivers, uh, different, uh, different batteries and also different emitters. Uh, this has a, a triple emitter stuff like this. This is, this is basically, uh, the equivalent of a, of a triple A as far as the diameter. Uh, this is a one inch diameter. So it's, he calls this the peanut. Uh, so we're offering something that's kind of like a, a middle ground in between these as far as like um an entry level into high-end flashlights um and something we haven't talked about now uh s- s- talked about yet is the price point so these are going to be coming in at at 300 for the titanium version uh and we plan on doing uh bronze copper zirconium uh in the future uh so it's kind of just like our pins we're going to offer a gambit of different finishes different uh different styles to this this product line I was I was going to ask you uh, about the price point because um, I know that uh, just just uh, by being adjacent, I know that they are, are competitive with uh, fine knives in terms of how much they cost. Uh, but in terms of what you're offering, um, is this a, a a good deal in the in the pen world for a for a uh, for this light? I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry, it's not the pen world, the light. In the world. flashlight. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh, surefires are on the higher end of, of like mass production. Uh, this is 
a substantially higher quality emitter and battery and system than they offer at a very minimal price increase. Then once you go past this, you're going into a custom realm of Hankos, which are like $600 base price uh, to $800 base price. And then you go into uh, Oklahoma, which is like $500 base price. Uh, Charles's custom work is 500 close to $500 base price as well. Uh, so you're, this is, this is flirting with, um, custom quality with a production scale, which is, allows us to be able to offer, offer this at a, at a better price. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, this is like, uh, this is almost like a custom light. I mean, if it's, as far as I'm concerned, if it's being made, uh, in small batches in a, in a manufacturer, you know, and you're all self-contained to me, that's that, that feels custom. Um, you know, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess no, custom I, is when you're saying put a thing on my light or whatever, but, um, just to have it, have the hands on it and have each one made with care. Yeah. So like th this is similar to the archer as far as like, we're not going to be able to make hundreds of these every month. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a limited production, uh, because of our capability, because of how much, uh, more work goes into, setting them up right, getting them dialed in. Uh, this is this is not a pin uh, as far as the assembly side of it, and is also not a pin as far as the components that are required to be able to make it work. Uh, so this is this is a step up in that. And with that, um, like we've we've broken down what it costs us to make it, make these, and it fits in line uh, with with our price tag. And like I said, this is kind of like a step up from your Surefire Streamlights and a step down from your customs, uh, kind of hopefully a gateway drug for people to see a new community because the, the flashlight industry is definitely something that is unique. Uh, I've, like I said, been, been around it since like 2015 as far as the custom side of it. And uh, as a teenager, I had sure fires in my, in my pocket. Uh, so like, this is a, a really cool thing to be involved in. Um, so, uh, I know people are going to want to know uh, the availability of these, for instance, uh, well, not just the light, but you were just holding up the archer and it caught my eye yet again, and it will catch other people's eyes. Is this something they can just go to your site and buy or what's the deal? So for the flashlight, uh, we don't know how much demand is going to be, uh, but we aren't going to be able to make that many of these. Uh, so we, we do plan on having these released. Whenever we do release these, if they do sell out, we recommend people to just sign up for back in stock notifications. And as soon as we release another batch, get an email. Also follow our social medias, keep an eye on your emails. Those are where we will be informing you. So our personal Instagram, social medias, as well as our email list, those are the, gonna be the first people uh, that, are, that are notified for this. Uh, as far as the archers concerned, uh, the archers are currently sold out. I have a release happening tomorrow, uh, and we have releases every Thursday. Uh, but they're very much like a, a small batch system uh, because we aren't able to make that many of them. Uh, so right now, I think we're close to uh, 80 of these a month is what our production levels are able to maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, and demand is higher than that. Uh, so just keep an eye on our social medias. Uh, keep an eye on our emails. Keep an eye on our our website. If you see a product you like, sign up for back in stock notifications, uh, and that's that. Pretty much sums it up. Uh, let me ask you: What uh, you've worked with Richard Rogers? Uh, you've worked with uh, Matthew Christensen, two two great designers, great makers. Both been on this show, incidentally. Um, who are the and and TJ Schwartz also a great guy, um, extremely talented. Uh, who are some other designers uh, if that you'd be interested in? hooking up with uh so right now we're working with uh bob t bob trazula uh oh. we've got a, a prototype for a fixed blade over here in yellow uh that is by brian brown uh so that's going to be coming out soon uh we've i've i have um worked with over 60 different companies with the other businesses i've been involved in inside of just the edc knife community uh and i look forward to working with many more designers uh, we have a slip joint from a prolific slip joint maker slash designer, uh, and that's going to be releasing here shortly. And man, we've the roster is deep, and the roster of people I want to work with is just as deep, if not deeper. That's uh, awesome. Uh, can you can you disclose the slip joint, or is that uh, under wraps? 
I'm I'm not gonna not gonna say names just yet. Uh, he's a, he's a good friend of mine, uh, and I really look forward to seeing that model. I I've got one of his customs in the display case right next to me. Uh, I, I hope it's who I'm thinking of, and if it's not, I'm sure it's still awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and then that yellow Brian Brown prototype, uh, is that something you can bring closer up? Sure. Or? All right. So this Ooh. is his Osprey model. Uh, this is definitely more of a camp chopper knife uh, compared to like the, the Dread Eye. So I actually have a, a limited edition Dread Eye that's going to be releasing shortly um, that we can do for size comparison. So this is on the bigger side uh, compared to the... Um, yeah, the dread eye. What two point seven five inches on something the like that? That looks like a four inch right there. I think it's three seven five. I think it's got to be four. It's got to nice be four. Looking I don't have. I love Brian Brown's designs. Yeah, uh, that is beautiful. Thank yeah, you for showing that. Thanks. Uh, I hung out with him quite a bit in the Nashville shows and uh, California as well, uh, and it's been a pleasure knowing him. Uh, and he's been a designer that I've wanted to work with. Um, and we had a slot to be able to do a fixed blade. And I was like, Hey, I think yours, yours is a good fit. Uh, so we really like doing that. And then, uh, I'll go ahead and tell a little bit of the story of the Bob T knife that's coming out soon. I don't have a, a prototype. They've got handles that they're running on the machines for the, for the first prototypes. But the story on that one is really something else. Uh, and hopefully whenever we have the, that model coming out, hopefully we can hop on another podcast and I can show, show your fans on this example of this amazing knife. Uh, so getting into the knife and EDC community, I was always a knife collector, uh, carried bench base, carried Microtex as a kid. Uh, so this would have been 2014. Uh, I was just starting to get into the mid techs and customs. Uh, and I, I was at a flea market and was going over a, a gun dealer's table and I saw his showcase of knives. Uh, inside of there was a Bob T, um, I'm not gonna say the model, from 1988 in Jim Mint condition. And uh, it was $200 and I didn't have the, have the cash at the time, uh, so I, my dad actually bought it. Uh, and he's owned it and he's had it since then. I've handled it. I've taken pictures of it. I've always had a, like just really a fascination for this design. Uh, it's never come out as a production knife. And I think that that's a crying shame because it has great ergonomics. It has great lines and it fits the tactile DNA as far as classy and gentleman's carry. Uh, it's not the, the standard, um, ATCF. Tact yeah, it's, it's not the standard tactical that you see from a lot of Bob's designs. It's more on the gentleman's side, which he's done many of those in the past as well. But this is like so good. And it's been a, a pleasure to work with Bob and Suze uh, and to, in getting this design refined um, and bringing it to modern modern interpretation. So we've, we've tweaked very, very little. Uh, keeping the soul and the integrity of this model, and we look forward to showing it showing it to y'all here shortly. Oh, I can't wait! I love his designs, and he's you know he's a legend, and he's a legend for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's amazing uh, that he does still builds all of his custom knives very by hand, you know. Very much and, so. Uh, and man, they're awesome. And uh, his wife Suze is also awesome. Uh, as you mentioned. Um, all right. So now I'm going to have to go uh, rooting around in his, uh, in his back catalog to, to, to develop some uh, theories. And then we will definitely have you uh, back on. Um, what uh, have you, uh, as we wrap here, uh, have you thought about designing a knife yourself? And, you know, you are in the perfect place to do that. Uh, that's not my skill set. Uh, I've always been a collector. I've always been um, been a fan. I I I put my pinky finger in designs, uh, and I don't think I'm ever gonna. I don't, I don't think right now is is the right time for me to jump in. Uh, I'm not the the best with pen and paper. Uh, I'm the person that critiques and nitpicks, not the person that creates the creates the masterpiece from the ground up. Uh, so I, I'm honored to be part of a team. Uh, it's not my goal right now to be. Uh, the person that's putting the pen to paper. 
Yeah. And the reason I ask is um, that you're, as you mentioned, you're a collector and are a collector and you've had your hands on so many. Sometimes uh, those are the best qualified. But like you said, your role in evaluating and help guiding these projects, um, you know, that's 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 an even more uh, meta role. So. I'm, I'm sure just a piece of that puzzle. This is this is definitely a team. Uh, we've got our operations manager right next to me in the office next door. Uh, owner Will, uh, Tim, who's again a custom knife maker in it from his past. Kevin, who's becoming as, as much of an enthusiast as as anybody, as well as many people in the shop floor that are that way as well. Uh, and this is a group effort, both in the in the refining designs and the the assim building process of every single thing from even like our finishing team uh, gives us critiques uh, and gives us things that we take advice from uh, to refine things and just hone them that next 1%, next 10%. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for coming on and uh, showing us it, like really showing us some of these projects that are just about to burst. I'm so excited burst onto the scenes. <laughs> Uh, I'm really excited that and honored that you showed us here and I uh, cannot wait, especially now I got to say for the Chupacabra, because I know uh, I'll be able to get my hands on this, whereas the the archer is going to take more discipline for me. And mm -hmm. uh, um, but man, I can't I can't wait. It's very exciting. I'm very happy to see what's happening with Tactile Knife Company. Um, and we can all be proud um, that we have an awesome knife company right here in the United States doing stuff from the ground up. So happy to have you on, sir. And Thanks. I look forward to seeing you next time. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Miller of the Tactile Knife Company. Uh, it's been cool. This is the third time he's been on the show, and it's really uh, fun for me to see the evolution of this company. And, uh, I mean, they started amazing, and the, the promise just keeps coming. So, uh, very exciting. Keep your eyes peeled for the Chupacabra. Uh, if you like the Archer uh, and the Light, get on their web, uh, get on their email, and, uh, and be alerted to these drops. All right, everybody, be sure to join us on Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switch, er, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.